Okay, I want to call the January 20th uh, uh, workshop order at this point in time. This is a <coughs> workshop uh, between the Oshkosh City Council and with the folks from the Oshkosh uh, Grand Opera House. Uh, a little bit of background or a couple, a little bit of overview, at least I should say, is the Opera House is owned by the city. The facility is owned by the city and we contract <coughs> with the Opera House uh, Grand Opera House Foundation Board for basically operating the Grand Opera House. We've done that on a series of contracts over time that, that go back. We'll be looking a little bit of history of it, but to go back over years and there have been five-year contracts up to now. The most recent one was up um, on December 31st, so we're, we're kind of looking ahead and we want to have some discussion about what's going on, what has gone on, and, and then uh, see where we evolve with respect to a, a new contract. I think what I'd like to do is go around and have people introduce themselves. So I'm not sure everybody knows everybody that's here, so uh, I'll start. I'm Bert Tower, Mayor of the City of Oshkosh. Steve, why don't you go ahead? Uh, I'm Steve Cummings, City Council Member. John Fitzgerald, City Council. Mark Koloff, City Manager. I'm Alex Hummel. I work for the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, and I serve as the Secretary of the Oshkosh Opera House Foundation Board. <coughs> Terry Shire, I work for Thrivent Financial, uh, as a manager of fiduciary services for the Thrivent Trust Company, and I am serving as the treasurer of the foundation. I'm Frank Tower, I'm with the Hoffmeister Group, work in their IS department, and I am the vice chair of the Opera House Foundation. Joe Furlow, I'm the president and CEO of the Opera House Foundation, director of the Grand Opera House. Caroline Pansky, city council. Steve Herman, city council. Deb Alice Nosby, city council, and deputy mayor. Okay, good. I think everybody should have a copy of the outline as a outline for the workshop. Anybody done a copy? Okay, everybody's got a copy. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our city manager, Mr. Roloff. Thank you. I think uh, uh, Frank is going to start with a presentation, but the whole idea is to share information about the grand this evening, its vision, mission, get some feedback from council on, uh, on things going on, uh, some of the activities of the grand, S discuss expectations for a new, new lease agreement, uh, and then any other goals and uh, follow-up items that may be uh, necessary based on what happens uh, this afternoon. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn over to, to Frank to... Uh, to start with a presentation. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, just wanted to take a moment before we get into some of the slides and the presentation to just let the council know that we really like this format. This is great. We're hoping that as future reports come forward and we're able to share the story of the Grand Opera House Foundation with you, we can do it in this interactive manner. This is really, really uh, nice for us. Uh, prior reports were written, then we had verbal ones. Uh, the last couple of years, reports have been missed, so that's why this is really great and we're appreciative of the opportunity to allow the foundation and, of course, our CEO Joe and us to interact with you and of course to continue to share with the council the citizens of Oshkosh about their grand and then before we get into the actual slides I just like to share a bit of history and background I'm going to read some excerpts from the foundation report to the city at its second lease renewal uh, it's provided in later slides but I'd really like to share this with you and take this moment to emphasize kind of how we arrived here so this is the excerpt when the Grand was first renovated and reopened in 1986, it was the responsibility of the city to staff and manage the facility for those renting the Grand, community, theater, and schools, as well as concerts and event promoters. The city paid a staff, including an executive director, full-time secretary, as well as custodial and maintenance support to manage the activities. The responsibilities of managing these activities also proved more than what the city wished to handle, and the activity was creating a regular shortfall with expenses far exceeding income generated from the above mentioned activity. In response to these shortfalls, the city solicited proposals, and the Oshkosh Opera House Foundation was selected as the new management team. The vision of those who sought to secure the Grand Opera House for our community and protect it to the future led to the establishment of this support. So with that, let's get a little bit of history of the Grand and the Foundation. When we think of the Grand, there are really two different identities. There's the historic Grand Opera House and the Grand, which goes beyond the walls in ways that improve our downtown, our students' arts education, and our community's identity. First, the building. Built in 1883, when Oshkosh was the second largest city in Wisconsin, it's the oldest operating theater building in the state, one of the oldest public buildings in the city's inventory, and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The Grand is older than the Eiffel Tower. 
It's older than Coca-Cola, older than the hamburger. When the Grand opened, Chester Arthur was President of the United States. The Washington Monument was half done. The telephone was brand new, and radio and TV were years in the future. In fact, the building is old enough that the first capital improvements were the addition of electricity, furnaces, and restrooms. Originally a site for touring performers and local gatherings, not unlike today, the Grand was privately owned and had an identity in its first hundred years as a performance hall, silent movie house, movie theater, and even a stint as an adult movie house. In the 1960s, as the building deteriorated, groups within the community began the first Save the Grand campaigns. The efforts took over 20 years, but by 1986, Oshkosh taxpayers voted to have the city of Oshkosh purchase the building and invest in its renovation for community use. When the Grand was first renovated and reopened in 1986, it was the responsibility of the city to staff and manage the facility for those renting the theater. The city paid a staff, including a full-time executive director, full-time secretary, as well as custodial and maintenance support to manage those activities. The responsibilities of managing the activities proved more than what the city anticipated and was creating a regular shortfall with expenses far exceeding income generated from the operation. In response to the shortfalls, the city solicited proposals and, in one of the earliest public-private partnerships in Oshkosh, the Oshkosh Opera House Foundation, created specifically for this purpose, was selected as the new management team. To offset the costs the foundation would incur in managing the hall, a funding mechanism was set up. This was designed to both offset the physical costs of operating and caring for the theater, and to support the overhead requirements necessary to appropriately manage the hall as a resource for the Oshkosh community. The foundation's responsibility was to raise the additional funds needed for programming, additional staffing, and related community activity. This partnership celebrated its 25th year in 2014. In 2009, a new crisis hit when, as part of the privately funded enhancement of adding the Grand Lounge, structural defects were discovered in the Opera House roof. After a major community discussion, a second renovation took place in 2010 to fix those structural defects and add fire protection systems. The Grand Lounge was also completed during that time. The Opera House Foundation raised the funds for the Grand Lounge renovation from the private sector, as well as for the needed HVAC improvements for the theater annex. So that's the Grand Opera House. Now what about the Grand? We know it's that wonderful 1883 Victorian theater. We know it's a big part of our revitalized and growing downtown. We know it's a living, breathing piece of history. But it's more than a building. The Grand is a state of mind reaching out beyond the walls of the Grand Opera House. This season, the Grand is open to the public for over 175 public events, which include touring artists, educational programming, citizen artists, independent promoter shows, three resident arts organizations with over 30 performances, two high school productions, cabaret performances, meetings, Sunday gatherings, special occasions, and even weddings. Add in rehearsals and support days, and we're serving this community over 250 days this season. It's the place where citizen artists thrive. Each year, hundreds of actors, musicians, and artists are part of what makes the Grand special. In addition to the artists of our arts partners, the Oshkosh Community Players, the Oshkosh Symphony Orchestra, and Hysterical Productions, there are citizen artists coming front and center for Gallery Walk, After Walk, the new performance Afterglows, and in standalone concerts and performances both on the main stage and in the Grand Lounge. We take great pride in being center stage for our region's citizen artists. In addition, the student artists and student audiences are an important part of our vision. In any given year, thousands of students are in our audiences for the Student Discovery Series. They're on our stage in their own productions. They're watching or supporting their classmates, or they're experiencing an outreach program like the Arts, the Other Basic Human Need Residency, which encompasses and reaches out to students both in school settings and through other community partner agencies. We're not done. A goal for the arts in our community is every child, every grade, 
every year. And we won't stop until we make that happen. Support comes from many areas. The basics of operating the city-owned building on behalf of the groups above and their audiences is supported by the owners, the city of Oshkosh. Ticket sales and show sponsorships enable the touring shows to break even while keeping our audience's prices competitive despite our much more intimately sized hall. The Grand Lounge continues to grow as a hospitality center and a cabaret venue. One dollar per ticket sold is returned to the city of Oshkosh to help pay down the 2010 repair bill and new initiatives are on the board to assist in that area. Private support enables so many of the other wonderful things to happen. It supports the continuing events, of course, but annual donations support the educational programming, partially subsidized rental rates for schools and for free community events, hundreds of tickets given away for community fundraising projects, free events like Gallery Walk, After Walk, and the Grand Scoop, community outreach like the Artists in the Schools program and the Arts the Other Basic Human Need. Our signature fundraiser, Oshkosh on Broadway, has gathered statewide attention. It features dozens of civilians, local people, who aren't regulars on stage, who perform in a musical review to benefit educational programming. Politicians and CEOs perform alongside less visible people in our community in a night that's both fun and successful. The grand staff is small, eight staff members and some part-time employees. They're supported by a small army of dedicated volunteers whose skills and service are just an enormous part of what makes all this happen with an annual budget just shy of $1 million. Our goals are big, but they're centered in our sense of community, in our creativity, in our children, in our future. In our increasingly virtual world, we're more connected but have less contact than ever. We're more connected but more segmented than ever. More connected but more divided than ever. There are only two places in most communities where people regularly come together with those who are different from themselves. The stadium and the theater. And in the theater, nobody loses. Great. So that provided a little bit of background history of the Grand and kind of what got us here to this moment. So with that, I'll turn things over to Alex to share some programming and operation status. Alex? Great. Thanks again for having us here tonight. Really appreciate it. You may have recognized yourself on one slide. It was right alongside you up there. It was pretty fun. Um, you know, we, a lot of what I'm going to talk about you've already sort of seen laid out in that presentation, so I'm not going to waste a lot of your time with that. But let me go over some of the numbers, some of the data and some of the big initiatives that we have. Um, our mission is to expand the significance of the historic Grand Opera House by maintaining a financially secure organization that serves the community by promoting and enhancing the performing arts, social, and related educational opportunities. I think it's just important to emphasize that to you and to our public audience out there. And our vision is to be a collaborative and innovative leader in providing entertainment, social, and educational opportunities for the community. How do we do it? What is our focus? I'm really proud to say that as a board, we, we wrestled with some of our strategic uh, uh, priorities this year. And what we came up with was a list of priorities and vision and goals that I think dovetail pretty well with what the city already has going for it. Our identity as event city, our place as a destination for tourism. Uh, how do we marry up with our native downtown how do we um, involve local talent and local artists? So that's one of our, some of our strategic goals. It's, it's uh, something we're quite proud about. And I think you know, when it comes to executing these goals, you see it happening every day. We want to make sure we get every child, every grade, every year involved in the Grand Opera House. We're not there yet, but using that place as a classroom for this community is critical. And we're starting to make it happen. Also to make the Grand a center stage for our region's citizen artists and performers. This is a note of distinctiveness for us in Oshkosh. Not just for the Grand, but for Oshkosh. We have a jewel of a theater and we use it. We use it. We not only uh, are entertained there, but we also use it to showcase our own talent and develop our own talent. Uh, whether it's you know, artistic or whether it's future skills. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. 
Um, <clears throat> our performance series has, has been incredibly successful. I think, you know, when people see these big names, they know these are the people that have really been the, the headliners uh, of the Grand Opera House nationally uh, in the last several years. Jeff Daniels has been such a huge, huge ally of what we have, and, you know, he's, he's, he's been there. Uh, he's been there multiple times, and we're so proud to count him as an ally of, of the Grand Opera House. Debbie Reynolds has been in the past. I mean, she's one of the grand arms of, of screen and stage. Uh, she's graced our stage recently. And uh, you just read in the Northwestern um, about Jim Belushi coming to town with this improv troupe, which if you watch any social media or other interactivity online, people are psyched. Um, so you're getting that national caliber entertainment at the Grand Opera House, which is one of the core principles that we want. We want to make sure that we're bringing people to the grand, we're bringing people to the city, and these are the many of the names that are helping us do it. Next up, you know, we want to point out too that beyond the shows that we reach out actively to help schedule and book, there are artists who come knocking on our door. Artists like George Winston, artists like Arlo Guthrie and Leo Kotke. They're they're coming here uh, regularly. If it's not every year, it's maybe every few years because they know the intimacy of the hall. They know the history of it, and they know the appreciation that they're going to enjoy. So those independent promoters lean on us to help them co-promote their shows. But in truth, they really do come knock on our door and sort of season and augment some of the great programming that we're actively going out and seeking through our executive director and the staff. The Student Discovery Series is uh, really when, it, when that every child, every grade, every year philosophy um, gets down to the nitty-gritty. This is where you've got you know, that ribbon of buses, as we like to say, lining our street, our community street. This is where the Grand becomes classroom. And I'll say this, and I'll admit it, if there's one thing I don't think we've done a good enough job of, it's tell our community this story right here. That when our students uh, come to the Grand Opera House, they are learning. They're connecting what they see on the stage often with what they're learning in the classroom that they're coming from. For example, on the left, you see the crucible there. Um, you know, incredibly important and incredibly educational uh, experience for students. Teachers are aligning what they're teaching curriculum-wise with resident artists. So I think that's really powerful. Um, in fact, in the last 10 years, and again, this is just in the last 10 years, we've seen the number of schools attending the Grand Opera House reach 274. The number of school districts represented is 66. The number of homeschooling families and educational cooperatives that have come to the Grand has eclipsed 180, and that represents in itself 33 school districts. And these are coming, these people are coming from school districts and places all around our region. In fact, when we were talking to the staff in our uh, strategic planning mode you know, a few months ago, um, I marveled at it. I, you know, I had no idea uh, that we had so many people you know, firing up buses, making a day of it, making the Grand part of their educational destination for their students. So the Grand total there about 96,000 students, and that's in the last 10 years. We should emphasize that the Discovery Series and this important facet of our mission has been going on for 20. So it's got a real rich heritage. We have arts partners that we want to help propel, promote locally. Hysterical Productions, uh, the Oshkosh Symphony Orchestra, the Oshkosh Community Players, these are all organizations that uh, don't work unless you have citizen artists at the helm. And it's really, um, for me, it's a huge uh, point of pride when we can see people that you know in the community, people you work with, people you go to church with, people who your children and their, their parents are, are uh, in school communities with on stage. This is, again, huge distinction for us. And I think it also brings in audiences because these people are quality uh, performers and artists, and we all benefit from that. The Ashkosh Symphony Orchestra. Just a quick shot of, of them using our stage. Um, one concert on site this year, uh, we had 400 people attend attendance, so that's a huge, uh, huge draw for us. Oshkosh community players have, have logged 15 performances and, uh, again, estimated currently in this current season uh, attendance to be at about 2,400 patrons. And Hysterical Productions uh, has uh, staged 17 performances individually here at the Grand. And then, again, in the 14-15 season, our estimated attendance is about 3,800. Broadway caliber production of Les Miserables, which again also had a, little, a lot of educational focus and component to it, um, drew 2,400 people to the Grand Opera House. So that was an incredibly, incredibly successful local uh, production and I'll say experiment. I think it's proving that you can 
lean on local talent, to draw local audience, local pride. It's something distinct that we do, and it's something we should, we should all be proud of in Oshkosh. At After Walk, which is, again, this is a great example of how we are directly connecting to the vibrancy of the downtown. After the gallery walks on the first Saturday of our month, we invite people to come on in and f use that space that the foundation and the grand helped build, uh, the uh, grand lounge, to feature local musicians, local visual artists, young, old. Um, it's another way that we can flex that space as like a cabaret atmosphere and develop more distinctiveness for ourselves. We're really ex excited about uh, what's happened with After Walk already. And again, educational partners, um, every child, every grade, every year. Our high schools get the opportunity to use the grand at reduced rate rent, and in fact, rental rates that have been pretty much steady, if not frozen, for years. I, I, I'll come back and have to quote you the exact number. Um, it's been a long time. But not only are they getting the opportunity to express their creativity, to you know, take part in local culture, they're learning skills. They are learning teamwork. They're learning how to design lighting. They're learning how to engineer a set. This is another way that we're helping leverage that space, not only as an entertainment venue, but as an educational force for good in our community. So we're so proud to have you know, regular and diverse use of the Grand Opera House as that Broadway-style stage that I think students aspire to, to go to. Um, it's, it's a huge success story. New City Church is one of the faith communities that knocked on our door and said, uh, can we use the grant uh, as a hall, as a place for, uh, for services? Now, if somebody else wanted to come and say, we'd like to use it too, I'm sure that conversation would be had. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's a rental opportunity on Sundays, and they've used it and embraced it. A lot of the community engagement uh, success stories that we've had are heralded by the state. We heard in the presentation that Oshkosh on Broadway is one of them, but there are other ones too. Um, the Grand Scoop, which is where we literally open up the doors of the Grand Opera House to the community, invite them in for ice cream, learn more about the season ahead, face painting, uh, community activities. Um, it's been heralded by our peers in the state and by other uh, arts collectives as a real uh, triumph. Uh, and it's actually been a, uh, cited as a best practice. The Top 100 Preview Night, where listening to our uh, leaders, I guess, what, maybe now a decade ago, maybe even before that, um, engage our own citizen owners of the property in how we can better um, line up talent there, um, it, it's been a huge success. So the top 100 acts are often coming straight from the, the imaginations of our audiences. And it's working very well. In fact, we had one uh, this season that I had the privilege to attend. And I, I put my little badge on as a board member, and I started tapping people on the shoulder before the show. And I asked them, you know, where are you from? And that's when I started hearing, well, from Wausau. Great. Heard Minneapolis. Um, people who were making the trip that day, staying over, hanging out, making a weekend of it. Um, that was incredibly encouraging. So not only was this a locally generated concept, but it's also something that's drawing non-local guests. Uh, so I'm, I think we're, we're pretty excited about keeping that tradition going. And then, of course, one of the things that, one of the biggest success stories I think we should all be proud about, too, is our Stand with the Grand campaign back in 2009-10 when we experienced the, uh, the roof crisis at the Grand. And the community just naturally rallied uh, around the property and said, we're not going to let it fail. And we didn't. And uh, it's been a hard go uh, getting things back up to pace, but we're doing it. And um, people around the state noticed. They saw this campaign and uh, applauded us for it as a community, not just as a board, not just as an organization. Again, the uh, top 100 has been, you know, cited as as a as a real winner. And um, I think, you know, if you haven't already seen other organizations like ours following our, our lead, they're going to be. Um, when you've got your citizens saying, we would like to have this show, can you make it work? And we investigate it and then respond and do make it work so we get the artists here. Um, I think that's a big win for, for Oshkosh too. And again, the grand scoop, just a few shots here of some of the uh, diversity of things happening under that one roof that weekend. Uh, it's pretty great. I make it a habit and I know what most of our board members do to pop down there and uh, enjoy it. Um, it's a great spotlight on community beyond the uh, season lineup. 
other examples of community engagement that we've really we've really built into the rhythm of the grand um, our Oshkosh Public Library uses it for its its reading program um, the community festival of Thanksgiving our community band Christmas carol sing which has become a holiday tradition I think many people many families many residents build into their their calendar and schedule um, participation in events like the farmers market which I completely forgot there's also <laughs> that um, the Oshkosh a music artist series and the chili cook off right there in Opera House a Square in support of various schools with uh, theatrical equipment rentals things that will loan to them and other professional expertise that we can provide as a staff to make sure that when they do get to the grand for their their performances and their stagings that they get the most out of the experience for them and their families we've also been really blessed to be able to feature artists in the community not just artists who come and perform on the stage or in the cabaret style um, uh, grand lounge but artists who are going out venturing out of the four walls of the grand and into the community and making that part of their work they visit Christine Ann domestic abuse services they'll visit cancer survivors in local hospitals and share their musical talent as kind of a, a source of solace and inspiration um, they will give private lessons and one-on-one -on -one tutoring to student you know vocalists like you see up there in the right hand corner that's that's Bill Zafiro who's a uh, lauded award-winning New York cabaret artist um, and uh, I would say historian of, of that art and genre and he's been here a couple times to share his talent with the community and he's just absolutely fabulous guy so our students get that direct contact with the uh, the artists that uh, that visit us programming wise we shared these numbers a little bit in the presentation so I don't need to drill down too much into them um, but you know again the bottom line is the grant is in use for 260 days in 2014-15 some days have multiple events just you know for the record 96 public performances 83 other events open to the public overall 179 total events again 33 private events that's meetings and weddings included and also 113 rehearsal and support days so the place is rarely if ever dormant um, something's happening in the Grand Opera House which is a testament I think to our staff but also to all of us in the community that are using it because it belongs to us great thank you Alex yep so then I'll turn things over to Terry and he can share with all of us some recent financial stats. Terry thank you Frank yes I'd just like to take a, a few minutes to talk about the few items that you see there on the agenda particularly the financial condition of the Opera House Foundation uh, so a brief overview of the sources and uses of the funds the expense how the expense structure looks the, the fund the uh, the income structure looks briefly touch on the roof replacement and the Grand Opera House Foundation pledge and also um, last just talk a little bit about the leasehold improvements the equipment that was purchased by the foundation over the years so touch on those four main items um, we would characterize our group our, our foundation board would characterize the financial condition of the foundation as solvent stable and improving um, though we though it can make money lose money in any given year due to a host of factors its primary purpose is to provide service and programming to the community over the years the foundation has succeeded in overcoming the limits of its modest size but it, we've been able to generate a balance a uh, I'll call it a critical mass of support that sustains <coughs> the foundation board from year to year the foundation from year to year excuse me as y you would expect from a nonprofit organization the ongoing challenge of maintaining the level of services expected by the community has meant that we've had to find we've had to cultivate explore develop new contribution sources um, each and every year that we operate We've occasionally faced year-end shortfalls, but have rallied to find the additional support necessary to keep the operation going. And in our particular industry, we would uh, classify that, or we would consider that a sign of tenacious success. To leverage the nearly $200,000 in city support, which is consists of the room tax and, the, and, the, and a budget item, um, the foundation raises nearly seven hundred thousand dollars a year as it is in our budget for 1415 and and that is in donated support service fees ticket sales and all of those all of the above are necessary to maintain the facility and again to provide the programming and the services that are expected by the community 
uh, from the grant. In addition, there is also the foundation holds a fund at the community, excuse me, the Oshkosh Area Community Foundation. That is a fund that is that was established some time ago that has never been drawn down upon by the foundation. We have let it grow. We've received contributions over the years. Roughly, it's roughly 141,000, but the decision has been made not to draw down upon that. Let it grow, let it build, so that eventually someday it can provide some meaning, meaningful support to the foundation and support the mission. Um, income. Next slide. Okay. Yes. Sources of income. This pie chart reflects the sources of income for the Grand Foundation. Ticket sales represent about 20%, rental and earned income about 17%. By far the largest component of our income is donations and sponsors, which is roughly 41%. And of course the city support around just above 22%. We look at this, sometimes refer to this as a four-legged stool. Um, there it is right there. Again, all four of those sources of income represented as a leg in that stool. And all of these sources are critically important to the successful operation of the grant. In any given year, as has been the case, any one of them could suffer. Any one of them could be down, any one of them could be up, but we could still keep standing. Um, we would have to depend on others, obviously, to support and, um, and to close the gap and support the shortfall. On the expense side, of our financial operation. Uh, those are the, those are the, that's the breakdown of the operating expenses in five categories. Presenting expense, 22%. Rental related expenses, about a half percent. Administrative expenses, 11%. Uh, personnel, 34. And then facility, which is the city funded portion of this expense, uh, about just, uh, just under 24%. Now, where is the city funding used? Uh, this is a breakdown of the facility, what, what is the facility operations expense, which is the city funding portion. And there you have in that pie chart, it's a little hard to see with, without the lighting, but the percentages are there on the right as well. Maintenance and custodial, 11%. Utilities, about 24%. Box office, 27.5%. Sound and lighting, equipment lease costs, 8.5%. Operation wages, and benefits 29%. What's important, what we want to point you all to, though, is the, is the, is the bottom, the asterisk, particularly. It refers to what this, what this reflects is the, it refers to event management and operations management only. What you're seeing is only referring to those specific expenses or um, expenses related to our operation. The foundation CEO, the marketing, the education, the development staff, are not included in this figure. It's only the event management and operations management only that's represented by that operations, wages, and benefits, or excuse me, the, the facility operations expense supported by the city. Um, again, it, inc it, inc it includes only services and personnel necessary to operate the theater. And again, I wanted to point out, it's regardless of who, who operates the, the brand. Um, and again, it's always, the point is, it's always in accordance with the spirit of the agreement back in 1989 when it was originally um, worked out. Next item I'd like to talk about briefly is the roof repair and pledge. I'll give you an update on that. It is well known by everyone here that they're doing the stand with the grand crisis back in 9 and 10. In addition to providing the services of the grants director and operations manager uh, to the city to support project manager John Urban, the foundation committed to contributing up to $250,000 over 10 years to be raised primarily through a service fee added to each ticket sale. And as we reach the halfway point in that mark, in that, in that commitment or in that pledge, the funds turned over to the city have tracked below the curve. Uh, the, and the, the reason is we've had reclaiming the audience after being shut down for 18 months during the recession, recession was slower than anticipated. The foundation acknowledges this sh situation. We acknowledge that the service fee amount as well as other sources of income need to be explored. 
should there be a continuing lease agreement. The logical time to implement such a change with, is with the contracting of the 1516 shows that, uh, in, unfortunately, in the absence of a lease, there, we have not been able to let formal contracts to acts ticketed events beyond June 30th of this year in anticipation or because there is not a lease in effect beyond that time. With that said, we are continuing to take reservations from local uh, arts groups, education partners, um, and, and logging those and, and receiving those and reserving those times for those groups, but not for ticketed events beyond June 30th. Next is related to the foundation investment in theater operations. Uh, in order to operate the grand in the fashion determined by both the city and its um, partners, its community partners, there's a basic level of theatrical production and equipment that is needed to operate the grand according to the expectations of the community. The grand was never fully equipped for such use. This meant that supplemental equipment had to be rented and or purchased since 1989. With the exception of the replacement of stage curtains, most original equipment, when it became obsolete, was taken out of service and replaced with foundation purchased or rented equipment. And what this slide represents is the breakdown of the investment in the operations and the equipment, whether it be owned by the city, owned by the foundation, or owned, or excuse me, by, or rented. That's a representation of the type of equipment that, it, that is needed to operate the grant. Um, and as far as the foundation purchasing this, we felt we were better, being better stewards of the grant by purchasing or leasing the equipment than we would be by continually requesting capital improvements from the city to replace or supplement the obsolete equipment. Um, last, as far as investment by the foundation, mentioned earlier, mentioned in the, uh, in the narrative and the video, the initial part of our presentation, the Grand Lounge Enhancement. Uh, originally conceived back in 08, um, it was entirely privately funded, uh, adding up to over 500,000 in privately funded uh, sourced um, funding from donors <coughs> and supporters of the grant. And that is a breakdown of that private investment that is a real complement to the overall operation of the grant. It's been very well received and belie we believe has added significant value to the overall theater operation, to the overall structure. And at this point, that's all I have. I'd like to turn it back over to Frank. Thank you, Terry. So just a quick recap as we're getting uh, then to uh, the next point, point six here, then I just want to once again emphasize how appreciative we are to be able to come here and share history, operations, financial status. Uh, and just so everyone knows, for your information, we've provided everything uh, you've seen there electronically to Mark, so it's on a drive that he can share with you. Uh, and that includes this presentation with the written narrative. Uh, it's got Terry and Alex's notes. It has a calendar of events and usage for the current season. So the, the calendar that Joe has literally showing everything that's booked in the facility, you'll have a copy of that as well. Uh, we've got a list of the original assets uh, as well as the current asset list from our most recent, recent financial audit. Uh, there's a rental rates information in there and of course electronic version of our audited financial statements for fiscal year 2014 so all of that is in Mark's possession and he can get distributed to you through uh, normal mechanisms that he has at his disposal so then just as we're concluding here uh, you've heard that we from Terry that we've taken reservation requests for our arts and education partners but we haven't issued those contracts yet for the next season it's just not a responsible thing for us to do at this time we are preparing but have not begun that process uh, for the top 100 to let people come into the grand and see opportunities and booking our performance and student discovery series so Kind of my point there is many of you had said this agreement needs to be reviewed quickly, and we absolutely agree with that and are ready to assist you in any way we can. So once again, thanks, and I'll turn things back over to Mark and to Burke for diving into the lease agreement or whatever is next. Mark? <clears throat> sure. Um, if we could get the lights. Uh, just wanted to walk over some of the lease agreement. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions and uh about how the lease agreement has evolved. The lease agreement has evolved a lot, to, and that's, that's an understatement. Um, I think the lease agreement, when it was done, was, uh, was talking to people, 
was just copying old agreements but in practice things have changed quite a bit um, from that um, I don't know exactly when general fund support to the grant started but it precedes me and in fact the number has gone down in recent years primarily because when mr. urban took over um, the facilities management we identified some areas that we felt we could save money on for example the um, uh, the elevator inspection we have many elevators throughout uh, the, the city organization so we folded that back into to our um, uh, our contract although we still charge it to that account but uh, the general fund support um, I think I may have shared with some of you I had an opportunity to uh, talk with uh, former city manager Bill Free just to get a little perspective on on, on some of this and some of the history and uh, th one of the initial directions he had received from the council back in the 80s was do whatever you can to keep this off the tax roll bill and that was really what guided um, the early years and uh, even and I would supplement what was said uh, in the presentation um, much of what mr. <coughs> free had told me was that the foundation was something that was put together with the cooperation of the city because Bill recognized that having it inside an internal city department wasn't a sustainable thing and uh, a privately run foundation tended to attract more private support so that was one of the reasons that they did that uh, but it was a combination of the city and and the the makings of a Grand Opera House committee that was internal to the city um, created the foundation from that and uh, and as the, the handouts I gave you the other day in 89 it was recognized that we needed something totally separate from the city and that's really how the foundation came to be um, in the agreement itself it doesn't have any provision for the the general fund support I think uh, best I can tell from what I've seen is that the room tax uh, that was carved out for the grand wasn't sufficient enough to cover the costs um, and so that was added um, there are things in there and and I appreciate uh, getting a copy of the uh, the flash drive that has the rental rates uh, yeah the rental rates clearly say in here uh, council supposed to approve the rental rates the rental rates have not been approved by council as long as I've been here Joe doesn't recall the council approving them in his history but he did a little digging and perhaps the last time it was before the council was and Burke shaking his head and that predates I'm not I'm not put, putting any ears on you mr. mayor but it's 11. <laughs> okay it's 11 <laughs> predates um, me too so Joe suspects it's, it's about I'm, I'm 11 it the 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 earliest the, the most recent review uh, of that happened at, from what I could find in 1991 um, it, it made sense there's a lot of provisions early in the lease and we can discuss this and you'll you'll tell us what you want us to do but there are a lot of things that evolved in the I also have uh, found the uh, original 1989 lease uh, and, and, and holding the two leases side by side you could see that there were things that were required when we were a brand new company and we wanted to have that kind of follow-up on a regular basis that over the succeeding five-year renewals were either revised or uh, ignored uh, and to be honest that's that's um, that's where we were on a couple of things uh, including that that annual review uh, it's never been asked or nor uh, uh, pursued in the 12 years that I've been in front of the council um, that doesn't mean that it shouldn't that doesn't mean that we won't that doesn't mean that we didn't willingly just put it into this proposal but uh, but we haven't had to do it uh, in a long time there are a couple of provisions in the lease and I think for a lot of different reasons I recall um, Steve council Herman say, uh, saying at one point early on that he just looked at this lease and went well, holy cow there, there's an awful there's an awful lot of start pretty from scratch it's pretty old data yeah it, it, the format today. itself I, I would agree with you on that Joe mentioned the written report the written report is in there um, it had evolved into an oral report to the council at an annual meeting Joe had done a couple of the first two years I was here and then after the the roof project it kind of well everybody knew what was going on because the, the roof was under repair and we never brought it back so those are those are provisions that we have kind of fallen by the wayside um, I think we've it's evolved we've we've managed it um, 
the maintenance part there's some specific things referenced in the maintenance agreement but it's really more of a cooperative with with Joe and, and Mr. Urban and John's here to, to talk about those issues as they come up. By by the letter of the law, it says the foundation covers everything under a thousand dollars. The city covers everything over a thousand over a thousand dollars. The roof was kind of a no-brainer, and when it cost one point eight million, it kind of is a little bit above a thousand. But they work together on those those ones that are kind of in between because sometimes if you let it grow, a uh, hundred dollar repair can become a two thousand dollar repair. So we work through things um, uh, on those issues. But those are the types of things that are in the agreement that clearly have evolved over time. Um, but it's, uh, and I, I teased Joe at the, at the last Oshkosh on Broadway, uh, the council was assigned the dressing room that happened to be leaking that night. Um, totally random. But uh, totally random, as they said. But that was the first year I'd been down there, so uh, the, the other room was fine. But there are leaks and things like that that, that need to get addressed. And I think um, John's staff works closely with Joe's staff on those types of things. Um, but there's things that are they're going to eventually be coming forward. Um, from our management standpoint, we try to treat the grand just like any other building, whether it's the library or city hall or the museum. Um, if the roof project hadn't suddenly risen to the top, uh, the roof condition would have been evaluated as we've been, as we've been doing since John's been doing facilities. We evaluate our roofs, we evaluate, evaluate our HVAC systems because we want to make sure that the, the one that's in need of mo the repair the most gets done first. Uh, we just did one with the museum, and that was because that was the one that needs it. There is some HVAC work that needs to be done over at the Grand, and, and we'll get to that as time goes on. Um, other things that are, are more unique to the Grand, like carpeting, that's an issue. The chairs, seating is going to be an issue. Joe, um, at one point during the roof project, had suggested, well, do we want to take a look at that? And, well, why don't we just you know start taking a look at some of these things? And I said, Joe... I got enough problems with the roof, let's not go there. <laughs> but eventually, things like, like chairs, and I think the, the foundation had discussed a, a sponsorship of, of seats and things like that that are on there. But the chairs are going to eventually have to be repaired. We don't want to be in a position, for example, and I don't want to single anybody out, but like Web, well, Webster Stanley Middle School, the condition of those theater seats, which just recently got a donation. We don't want to put ourselves in that situation. So those are things that John and Joe, I think, regularly talk about um, and John treats it just like any other city facility from from that standpoint um, those are the the primary issues in there but when mr. Hartman and I talked about uh, leading up to this one of the discussions we had and and I would prefer maybe to leave it open to Q&A right now and I think I told council members I really <coughs> wanted to be done at the 45 minute mark we're pretty close get questions from the council about uh, issues and concerns and then if we're going to be talking about a rental agreement it's not only about the room tax allocation which councils put a temporary uh, address to that it's really more what are we going to have in this agreement because this is a lot of outdated stuff and we just need to get ourselves up to date on what we're going to do for the future so I think that's uh, with that I guess I'd leave it open to questions either of staff with facilities and the, the board found the foundation board with how they do things programming is all 100% theirs um, as well as any financial issues so I guess <coughs> I'll leave it open to, to questions at this point yeah all the microphones are open so I, I got everybody wants to start just a <coughs> couple so questions um, uh, actually it's probably for a city attorney um, did the grand did you guys come forward to clear that there wasn't a church and state issue having a church and city owned property that was addressed that was addressed we did some we did some research and uh, i've had some experience in the past at other venues with this sort of thing and as long as we're not raising money uh or then, we, then we're in the clear we'll have an issue. Yeah. okay because technically they're leasing we're not operating a church we're leasing a building okay. for a meeting all right good um you mentioned the equipment um, that was city owned equipment replaced by the foundation. Did that have to be cleared by the city first before you go ahead and replace city equipment? We never did that in practice. I can I can yeah. cover that. I mean, I, 
let's use for I have an example from last mm-hmm. week. Um, the light board, the, the the board that controls the lights, um, went out of its useful life. It died. It's going to cost several thousand dollars to replace, and we have a show in three days. Um, it didn't. It never seems prudent. There's never a good time to come in front of the city council with a capital improvements request. I think you all know that. It's mm-hmm. it's hard to do, and. Years ago, and this predates me, but I've certainly endorsed it and continued the process. Uh, rather than sit with John and say, "John, twenty thousand dollars worth of equipment is going to go out of service this year. Can we put a capital improvements request in to replace theatrical lights and lighting controls, whatever?" Uh, and then go through this process. And, and, and this, I mean, you all know what we went through for carpet uh, and, and, and how and, and what we have to do uh, to make that work. It seems more prudent to either purchase the equipment. And own it, or we have a long-standing lease for uh, agreement with with our technical director for 30 years. It actually predates us, uh, where he has an inventory of equipment. He maintains it, he updates it, he works with it, and for a fee, we rent the equipment from him. <coughs> Last week, he came to me and said, "Are we going to go to the city and look for a replacement? I have a board." And swapping it in and out seemed the most prudent thing to do. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm not yeah, it's, arguing it's, that point. I guess yeah, I'm just thinking it, that should there be some level of, yeah, it's okay to go mm-hmm. ahead that, in that direction because it's sure. our building. Absolutely. But, you know. We do keep everything yeah. in the basement. It's all there. But, I've seen it. <laughs> uh, and actually, I, I, I should point out too, Counselor, that, that that's – that's not something we invented at Grand. I, I did a sim- I, in my ten year, years in Manitowoc prior to my eleven years here. We had a similar arrangement with a technician who owned and maintained equipment. This stuff turns over so quickly nowadays, particularly the sound sure. and light equipment, uh, that it's so much uh, easier and more common sense for us to allow someone else to worry about keeping that equipment up to date or uh, when it gets outdated to replacing it okay. uh, than it is for us to try to stay on top of it all. One of the things I w- will point out, somebody was asking me a question about the equipment, um, so I had staff start to dig. We did identify the exhibit that was in the 2004 lease agreement. Um, and at that time, and I'm not sure if the numbers that you have from your auditors are reflective of depreciation or not. The, 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 we don't depreciate your equipment. We are de- do a pre- depreciate the equipment we own. So it's not reflective. What is what the difference in the numbers could be, if there's a difference in the numbers, I haven't had a chance to look, is that the number I gave you and the number you'll see in the audited stuff also has the out-of-service equipment listed. There's not a lot of difference. Mm-hmm. I, uh, oh, good. The, the value from Exhibit A is 251000 and I didn't see the presentation until just now, but... 244 something in I that saw that. Mm-hmm. so yeah. but it, but what was interesting and and so I, I guess my question is is what's been added over time because there's a lot that's been added because the number that was in exhibit a back in 2004 the foundation had ninety four thousand dollars in equipment. I'll give you one good example because it, just finished. I'm sorry yeah and and the um, <coughs> on loan it says from Tom Hansen but I think it was just on loan period it was 170,000 back then and i saw a similar uh, higher number, higher number it's, it's yes about, it's not quite a third 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 but it's really close but there's a lot of equipment um i would say that in response to your question we to my knowledge have not gone through um a, an inventory retirement process with the grant and if there's a bunch of junk down there and the only reason we haven't retired it is because you didn't want to throw out our stuff we need to get over there and just say, okay, let's retire these things because they really, it, it, that's just a. No, I, I, I just think, again, for as a landlord tenant, anytime landlord, our equipment is owned, needs to be replaced, whether mm-hmm. we agree that the foundation replaces it or not, we should at least be sure. said, hey, this is what's going to happen, and we'd be more than happy to replace it. You had an example, John? I do have one example when that actually oh. did happen because it was big enough. For, I mean, it does make the council. I mean, yeah. I think that's something yeah. John Urban and the city Absolutely. manager can handle. I just think, you know. In one of my earlier years, and I think it predates my, our work with John, I think it was back when we were still in the parks department, um, all, we needed to replace the stage curtains, the black mm-hmm. curtains. Sure. That was a significant project. I want to say about 40000 or something just to do that project. Mm-hmm. And then we, we priced those, and eventually the main curtain, because they have to be fire retardant right. along the way. We did at that time bring that in. That was a capital improvements project. 
those the, the former curtains were retired uh, from the inventory and the new curtains were put in. So there's some adjustments that happen. Uh, they don't happen as regularly. And the process you described certainly makes sense. Yeah. So that's all. Just pointing out a thing. And then one last thing. Um, Alex kind of mentioned it, tracking room nights or talking to people. You receive over, oh, well, this year you're going to get about $148,000 in room tax. And that, that is you know, taxpayer dollars that you're getting besides what the city um, tax levy is. Uh, do you feel that you provide room nights? It, it depends. You know, no. By the strict definition of uh, heads and beds is the only measure of tourism, we do some. But do we do the same as, you know, a well-placed uh, athletic event? Right. No, not at all. But uh, my counter to that would be, from the research I've done, is while heads and beds is, is a standard in the industry, and I don't mean to talk tourism industry, but right. I don't really know except what I read, the idea of a cultural pride of place uh, is essential and important to tourism as well. What we do provide is that place that, uh, the example I'll give you is, we had a group come in, it was a small group, but it's still it's an example. Uh, during the summer, EAA were closed uh, because we, those dark days tend to go correspondingly when the big days of something else are happening in Oshkosh. They were here on the Monday after EAA, and they wanted a tour, and they wanted to go through, and I, I took people <coughs> through, and we, we, we gave them a tour of the theater, and they stayed an extra day. There's no way of us tracking that, but we could be the reason people stay an extra day. Not us. When I say us, I mean downtown. Sure. Uh, and, 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 and our role in tourism, I think, uh, is to support heads and beds whenever we can. But our niche in tourism is, to, is, is in the pride of place of making sure that downtown Oshkosh is a place to visit while you're already in Oshkosh. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. And, and the other thing, too, to understand, and I think uh, talking, Mark, with uh, Bill really helped kind of set that stage. The city realized that there was need for the city to provide a certain level of funding for the operations mm -hmm. of the sure. building. And it was at that point in time that particular mechanism was chosen. Sure. Now, is that the right mechanism for the future? That's up to the council to decide. There is a certain level of service and a certain level of investment <clears throat> in the city-owned building that is required for the operation. So if that comes from room tax dollars, if that comes from a general fund dollars, there's all kinds of things at the council's disposal. Sure. So that's really up to you to make a decision what makes the most <laughs> sense. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks. Other questions at this point? I'll throw one out. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to ask. Go back to the uh, the pledge, the two hundred and fifty thousand, which we know was, was not a contract, but it was there that night and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. heard that. I thought it was going to come both. It was suggested from a variety of, of sources, uh, including fundraising events, because there were some some of your board members mm -hmm. said, you know, we'll fundraise. We'll we want to put this two hundred and fifty thousand. Right. We'll put that uh, the pledge to to make this thing absolutely. Work. Yeah, um, it wasn't just said we're going to do it on the basis of ticket sales. That was one thing, and that that makes sense. Adding it on to ticket sales, um, plan for the future for that because as I see, <coughs> as I look at it now, it's been pretty much all ticket sales. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any other sources of income. Basically, sure. well, five years into it, right, and we've only got five left. I heard you know. Well, we still got five years left. Well, that's not anymore. I just. Too it's much. Not track my, background, <laughs> my background is such as I, I, I take 250,000 divided by 10 and I come up with a figure and I come about halfway through. And so I'm interested in a plan because sure. well, we've got sales at $10,000 mm -hmm. a year is not going to get it there. Okay. No. Well, and there's a couple of different things that as a board we have talked about already given the fact that we realize that the shortfall is there. So assuming an extended lease agreement or into the future, some opportunities are, of course, uh, an, a higher ticket fee, you know, go to 150, go to two. That's something that is out there. The challenge would be maintaining the ticket levels at a reasonable amount so that we still have people come in, the students, et cetera. Or do we extend it out? We've got a 10-year right now. Do we take it to 15 or 20 to make sure we can get to that amount? And then, of course, other fundraising. There's some I items that we have talked about, s separate, specific fundraisers, independent of, say, Oshkosh on Broadway, that are specifically designed for the raising of dollars to get that debt taken care of. So all of those have been talked about. Also right. to, a certain, to a certain extent, there's an identity. Uh, we, we've been discussing uh, more staff-wise than we have yet at the board level, but... We're due in our own development 
to to do some fundraising changes. We we want to get the option of the endowment out there. We're long overdue. We just keep getting distracted by you know fires. I probably shouldn't even use that analogy. Sorry. Um, but as we start to define this over the next few years, you can you can give money to the Grand Via X, Y, or Z. One of the things we've discussed at, at a staff level for trying to uh, augment this is to say, there's, there's the foundation and that money goes here. There is the annual fund and that goes to programming here. <clears throat> and there is this fund and you can donate here and it will go directly to paying down this amount. There haven't been a lot of people, you're right, Mayor, at this point who have just stepped forward and said, here's a check towards that $250,000. But there have been some. Uh, in fact, I just sent you a couple, I think, Mark, a couple days ago. Uh, they aren't huge, but they exist. And if they do exist at all, then a, a fashion of how we go about raising money uh, in, in the next few years going ahead. It's logical right now that we want to change the way people look at giving to the grand to elevate other sources where, where, where their dollars can go. And that's a place where we can raise the identity in this area in addition to what, uh, to what Frank has just said. Yeah, point. It, you know, mm -hmm. the ticket sales like raise another fifty cents. That raises some. That mm -hmm. and that helps. There's a limit there somewhere between of course dollars, one dollars, probably on the low side. Right. Dollars, maybe it gets high. But I think there's got to be that plan. And if the plan is just not letting people decide without knowing that that is an option, exactly. that's an important option that a number of people who were in that room committed themselves to. Um, they got to know. They got to mm -hmm. know that that's a realistic option and. Put a little bit of, of uh, you know, a little bit of push. built and push on that. So Agreed. I, I think that's going to be one thing that's going to be be critical mm -hmm. with an operational plan to do it, not just to let it kind sure. of happen because it's not happening natural. So that's sure. My on that. Did you, oh, John. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Sean. Well, if I could ask, because it's okay. it's actually the same question I was going to ask as as Mayor Tower, and just off of that is, what exactly is the plan if, in the event, say next year or later this year, there's a significant situation, and all of a sudden the city is faced with another significant repair, and again, more contribution from the city in the form of, say, a pledge if we opt not to close the grand, if it's another significant. How is the foundation going to deal with that? Because as I look at what's at the Oshkosh Area Foundation of 141,000, as well as what's in your cash reserves, you know, I mean, is there a strategic plan that's been thought out? Not just how do we take care of the pledge, but strategic over, overall for long-term success of the grant and the stability of keeping it in the community. And now well, we have to look at other options. Sure. Well, it would depend upon what it's for. Because remember, the building itself is owned by the city. Right. So there's going to be a threshold where, like the roof, as Joe pointed out and others, that's going to be a significant cost that would need to be taken care of by the city or some cooperation mm -hmm. with the foundation in the city. So right. from that perspective, it's going to be a partnership. So as far as other dollars do we need to keep the fundraising we need to keep the other development going that's where the dollars are part of the uh, the fundraising efforts and other things so there isn't going to be in my estimation and joe help me out here there's not going to be a million dollar or two million dollar project that the foundation is itself going to need to necessarily cover again it's a city owned building it's a, well, gra it's a great question though that's the that's the point is yes it's a city owned <coughs> building i 100 percent agree but then the city is forced to make a decision mm -hmm. do we look at it because right now what it's saying is that when the city ran it it was running you know at a deficit with shortfalls that hasn't changed despite the fact that we've handed over the operations somewhere else so at some point in time because you know in our budget you know we're not getting an influx of cash either and if anybody's been watching the budget and reading the newspaper or being at council and mr. tower you know I mean we've watched a lot of things decrease and I agree it's a city-owned building but it's not a shoe in that if there's a major a major thing that we can do it mm -hmm. sure. so if I understand what you're saying but it, yeah I know it's our responsibility but we then also may have a responsibility to make a very tough decision of course and that at the time because I was involved with the stand with the grand th there was 
thought that might be a possibility that there would be a pause because of the expense that perhaps they would not go ahead and continue the operations that we might have to take some time off raise the dollars it might be private it might be city and so that was a decision that the council faced and ultimately decided because we there were some state dollars that came in and of course our pledge to go ahead and keep the building but there was always the possibility that the facility was not going to be continued on and Joe you had a comment? I, I was just gonna say I, I, I think it's a great question the the, the simple answer to your question is have we thought about what would happen if the next big disaster happens no uh, but looking back at how the roof crisis in the stand with the grand thing happened everything you said is exactly the way it would likely happen again we had a crisis a price tag was put on it and the council said whoa we can't do this and so then we mobilized ourselves as a foundation and that 2.1 million dollar project or 1.875, whatever it ended up being. Uh, I went out and, and, and had some conversations with Representative Hintz, who went out and found some dollars in the state capital improvements budget to help knock that down. I wrote a grant. It wasn't huge, but it was there from the, the National, the State Historic Preservation uh, Foundation. That knocked it down a little. And we knocked that number down as far as we could knock it. And then we put that pledge on there to, until we got to a number that everybody felt grudgingly comfortable with, I think is probably the best way to put it. Um, we'd have to, as partners, work any crisis like that again. I'd like to sit here today and tell you, well, the first rest, uh, what I usually tell people is the first restoration fixed everything up to the roof line. The second restoration put the new roof up there and the building's built like anything now which is true but that still doesn't say there can't be another great crisis somewhere down I think we'd have to face that together and we'd have to find our way through it I don't think there's but, but even to that point though and I'll let Sean because she's on limit. <clears throat> just is there a plan in place to use less taxpayer dollars to operate the grant no okay well I, and I was gonna ask a question about you know find financial sustainability over the long term not necessarily for capital facilities but for operations I, I mean I, I, I guess I, I and I understand mr. Shire you said the board uh, concurs that the, the you know the finances have been solvent stable and improving and, and that may be over a longer period of time the last three years though and, and the information we provided we just got the the, the most recent audit today mm -hmm. but over the last three years that that isn't the case and and I mean unfortunately what what's happened in the last few years isn't going to be sustainable you 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 all know this i'm sure your board knows this over the the next uh, couple of years if if it were to continue unfortunately we leave to uh, lead to some larger problems the, the, the question about you know how how are those operational dollars going to be generated in 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 coming years and i, I guess we ask this question because the those the proceeds provided by the city are you know taxpayer dollars that that we feel we need to be good stewards of and 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 I, and I know you want to be good stewards of using that money as well but as there there's an imbalance uh, when when room you know, room revenue is growing in the community there was room tax dollars are going up uh, it's it's really it's unearned revenue uh, from the standpoint of of what Grand Opera House Foundation uh, operations do to, to to make that higher or lower so so uh, your, your organization is benefiting from higher revenues in that regard but uh, sure and, and keep in mind when, when there was less there was also less that was coming in right. as well through that funding mechanism uh, the, the thing to understand is of course we're coming off of that recession we're coming off of getting our audience back to the numbers before we went ahead and had the roof repair and I think you can provide some you know, here's, here's the thing and I, I this is I, I know I'm gonna my treasurer is gonna shake his head at me but it's the only way I can think of saying this out loud I hate audited financial reports I always have uh, as, as, an, as a CEO and, and here's why we live our lives at and operating a nonprofit, most nonprofits, almost on a cash accounting basis. We want to make sure there's enough cash coming in to support the programs and the events and the things that happen. And then we get to the end of the year and we audit ourselves. We have a professional auditor comes in and other things come into play, most notably investments and depreciation. And they skew those numbers and I sit in a board meeting going, I thought we were breaking even and we're Fifteen thousand down this year because there was twenty nine thousand dollars of depreciation because we bought equipment for the Grand Lounge and the depreciation went up and I'm like you shake your head and you do that. All I'm saying to you, Councillor, is you're you're right about three years. The depreciation's gone up because we opened the lounge 
and we bought a lot of equipment and the depreciation is, has gone up. If you were to go back five, six years when we actually built the lounge, you'd have a skew in the whole opposite direction and you, the audited financials of the grand four or five years ago would show $200,000 profit and $148,000 profit and, and those, they exist, they're there. Um, I'm, uh, they should be on file here actually. Uh, and I, so I, 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 there's so many other factors that go into that number. Uh, it's never as good or as bad as your audit shows uh, it, it, for us there. Terry, do you want to bring this around <laughs> into something <laughs> that I think if I've just totally messed up what you, how, you, how you'd <laughs> oh, say I'm that? Well, well stated. Right. Very well but stated. The, I mean, the, the cash, I mean, I, and I certainly can parse out which, mm -hmm. which components are cash and, and which components are, are uh, accrued on here mm -hmm. and which components are, are off the books. I mean, the, the cash position is even, I mean, it, 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 it I, I guess, generates some questions about a, a wider trend than what I'm asking about. That's, I, 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 mm -hmm. I, you know, is that a fair question to ask? I, I guess I guess the point that I made in my, in my initial question seems to be compounded by taking. If, if you're asking, do we find ourselves in a position where we need to go out and be more aggressively raising more funds than we already are? Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Understandable. And, and there have just just to interject real quick. You know, the board is like most boards do and should do if they're responsible boards. Uh, looked right in the mirror and said, "What's up? Um, you know, what are we going to do to step up our game?" as responsible stewards of this place. So that conversation uh, and some accountability measures that I think we built in and, and are held, holding ourselves accountable to, to track are kicking into a little bit stronger gear now too. Um, so it's one, one more layer of things, I guess, to consider. One of the slides, I'm not sure if it was you, Alex, or mm -hmm. Terry, showed $500,000 in community support and then for 2014, 2015, $700,000 in community support. That's a rather substantial increase, 35, 40-some percent. What comprises that number, and that, how do you plan to get that, 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 That's, that's me and my pie charts, Counselor. I, uh, 500000 is the average in community support we've leveraged. What constitutes the community support is my question. Everything that's not city support. Rental fees uh, for operating the facility what you pay when you when you buy a drink at the Grand Lounge, uh, donated support, corporate sponsorships. Um, so that my question is, how do you plan to go from 500000 to 700000 We're actually uh, above 500000 I just threw an average number out over 10 years. We had a couple of down years. We were closed for a couple of years. Let me just ask the question, because we're, we're trying mm -hmm. to sort of see. No, no, no. Is the trend line down with more difficult things ahead without a plan to, to go up? Or do you see some things that are going up? You know, for instance, you know, the, the question that pops into mind on that is you look at the, is essentially what's the, the statement of financial position. If you look 2013 to 2014, you've replaced cash with, cash with receivables. Receivables jumped tremendously. Receivables, quite frankly. <laughs> I discount receivables. I don't discount cash. Mm -hmm. So I don't, while the current assets remain the same, you've replaced cash with receivables in a fairly significant number. There's not a long enough period of time there to say receivables are good. You know. When I say receivables going up, that's a that's an issue. And replacing receivables on cash with receivables, that's even a bigger issue. So maybe Terry can comment on that. And I don't know what the history is that in prior years, if if this is just a bad year collecting or or if this is good because you've had far more ple pledges, I, I don't know the number behind the receiving. Yeah, I don't have the specifics of that, what drove that 13 to 14 difference, or what the trend was in the prior years available right in front of me, but I don't <coughs> specifically know what that represents in 14 at this moment. I can give you, I, I, I can give you a brief example. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, are, are these... Are you getting more of your receivables that are uncollectible because people aren't paying? And no, this is part. This is part B of why I, 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 I of my issues with with things like this. I and, and, and the folks at Clifton, Larson, Allen are watch that are watching are just shaking their heads right now because we go through this all the time. Um, gap changes about four or five years ago really changed the way that we at nonprofits uh, show our our money. If you, Mayor, were to decide you were going to underwrite a series for twenty five thousand dollars and you told me today that you were going to underwrite next season's series, then until I collected it from you, it would still be uh, accountable in the current year, 
as a receivable going into the next year. So much of the uh, the series and show sponsorship work that I do uh, to underwrite a show or to underwrite a series happens in the spring of the year prior to July 1st of the year we, we go into. Now, I'm not saying that is what that is, but I'm saying that could be a big part of what that is. And I recognize that, and I mm -hmm. say I don't have a history there. Typically, those things run the same from year to year because you're, you're facing the same issues, so they remain fairly constant. Because I just, and th so that's what I was asking. But you can see that this year was there something unique that happened that didn't happen last year because that, that same phenomena should have been mm -hmm. happening last year and the year before, and if so, that number ought to remain Understood. fairly constant. And so it, it's just it's just a question because we're trying to figure out kind of sure. what the financial condition is. And when I see a receivable figure jump like that, there are lots of explanations. Mm -hmm. But to your point, that should remain a constant over time. Although, but it may in, not. in theory, finding another donor who was going to give ten thousand dollars for a new series would cause that receivable number to jump ten thousand dollars. But by that. I would just ask him. And, 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 and I, I would I see cash replaced with receivables. And I want you to understand, I'm going to look you all in the eye right now, and I'm telling you, I don't know that that's exactly the entire amount of this change or, or anything like that. Just sitting here and looking at the number, I can't tell you that. That's the first example that jumped to my it's mind. All the though, it's, the one that, it's the one that tasks me. I read what's in front of me. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I, Joe, and, I, and I, I understand those those things can happen, but before we got this, uh, <clears throat> and I got it last Thursday before I forwarded it to council today, I looked at the 2012 to 13 and the trend I think you know overall it's like how are you doing you know Terry said we're doing okay but the last couple of years I know have been rough I mean we've talked about how rough it was when you were closed for a year and a half and you know I mean we're we're here with you what's I mean only everybody's watching on TV but what how are you doing and how are you planning to get out of some of these things when you see a forty thousand dollar drop in cash um you might be able to explain it but is it does it portend something worse and how are you managing to make sure that you're you're you crawl out of whatever hole you may be in as a result of everything that happened between 2009 and um 2010. I, I, and I don't, I mean, if I can augment what you're saying, because it, it gets it, to my question, and I, and I certainly, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, you guys are doing some good work over at the Grand, and I don't want to micromanage the finances, but when I see some of the revenue challenges, I'm not seeing some of the uh, it, it cuts in expenses that are associated, and, and maybe, you know, you have commitments to, 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 to people, to, to responsibilities they have, uh, but, but I'm not, you know, you're talking, and, and, and Mr. Hummel, you talked about, about, looking in the mirror at, at some of these things and making some changes and I don't know if that's one of the changes that, that you're looking at but any other organization not profit or profit uh, I mean you can you can only draw off reserves and, and run up lines of credit for so long and that, that was really my my question I you know at some point you have to start making cuts or you know take a look at are we are we managing our finances efficiently and as effectively as possible and and that's that th those are the kinds of things obviously that provide some long-term sustainability and, and I think which are going to make the taxpayers uh, 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 knowledgeable and satisfied that that city-owned dollars are are being put to good use. And on top of that is, I think we're all asking: Do you have a business and a marketing plan going forward? Is there something committed to paper? This is how you plan to go from the five hundred to the seven hundred thousand this this coming year, next year, three years down the road. Is there something in place? You were talking about. You know, catastrophic uh, things that could happen. Uh, do you have a, a re reserve fund, or is there plans to have a reserve fund? I mean, that's the right. The city is very. Our dollars are tight, and we may we may say we're not going to redo the next roof if it should happen. What do you have in place? What is your what if contingency fund and plan? And I just remember, as we noted, the the five hundred thousand is an average, so. It's actually more than that, but as far as the other question, I think Joe can best address. I, th I think uh, we, we do have uh, a marketing plan. Uh, we, we do a business plan in in the sense of have I committed to paper what we're going to do? No, we have a fundraising plan. Uh, we we have fundraising initiatives uh, in place, uh, and they're committed to in the board and the budget process. Uh, I can tell you that. Um, 
Uh, first, uh, do, uh, before I forget, going, getting back to uh, Councilor Fitzgerald's comment, I, I, I can tell you that in the, again, we're looking at it, you're looking at a two or three year snapshot right now as, as uh, so far in, in what you've asked me or asked us. In the 10 years that I've been at Grand, this budget has been as high as 950000 and as low as 600000 depending on what the issues and, and, and the crises have been. Uh, we have faced a, a, an incredible uh, cutback uh, series about four or five years ago for yeah. reasons that are pretty obvious from which we're now crawling our way back out of yeah. um uh, and i did i did take a look back over the last sure. seven eight years and uh, there's some years there i mean your your revenue is far <laughs> outpaced your expenses mm -hmm. so I, I recognize there was a number of years there where you had a, a trend that was quite the opposite and and there was some reserves that uh, apparently were, were being built up mm -hmm. strategically um we're putting a lot of effort into uh, into some key uh, funders uh, who have come up anonymously uh, strong for us this year. And I don't know if Terry wants to talk about that a little more than that, so you can hear a voice other than mine. There, there, there's a, a particular donor that is very interested in supporting the grant. Talk to me. Joe has been working very hard cultivating that donor, working with them. And one of their desires in this wanting to commit more is for the grand to produce or to host to attract higher profile names that can fill the seats something some, something to put like a halo type uh, of effect over the grand as far as an attraction a place that can fill the seats for example jim belushi for example um, um, Jeff Daniels, those type of acts that will draw a lot of attention from the media, a lot from the public, bring people from miles around. And that's something that this particular donor is very interested in doing. And stand, they stand ready to commit more. <coughs> this is just one example, but they have, there are substantial donors, substantial funds available, a very, very philanthropic minded. And, but I mean, you're asked about closing that gap, how, what are, what are you know the long-term direction long-term plan to, is cultivating those types of, of relationships with those types of donors who have that belief in that mission that are willing to to put forth a substantial amount of money to again fund that and I was pointing out I was looking you know the earlier comment was for stable improving I, the improving part a lot came from the 13 to 14 revenues you know looking purely at the cash and the, and the, and the balance sheet is one one way to look at it <coughs> Looking at how revenues have increased year over year too, and over the last several years since the closure, that's that is the improving part, and this this particular donor has helped in, a, in that regard a lot, as well as a lot of other donors. But the trend is the short-term trend. Trends are many years. I realize that, but there was a significant increase in revenues in a lot of different categories from 13 to 14 fiscal year. So, yeah, you know, and I, I agree. And it's important to bring in big name acts and we understand that the grand is limited in seating right. and and actually the Oshkosh market is limited in how much they'll be willing to pay for things but some of the numbers you're giving us 200 people are showing up to your shows and events so hopefully you're looking at programming that will attract more audiences and more more events in the grand and the bigger needs draw and when you're only averaging 20 to 34 dollars in it, ticket prices, it's difficult. You might make it 15, 16 thousand dollars a show if you fill the house. The math is so tough. We get it. it yeah, it, the it, math is tough. Sometimes difficult. those 200 people right. is a much better financial investment than 500 people uh, at a different investment right. too. And, and this is not an art at all to the Grand Opera House Foundation. This is any as if you watched the council meetings last fall, I brought it up that we're going to be looking at all our agreements with our because as other council members have brought up our dollars are getting cut you know the mandates don't go away but the funding goes away right. and so we're looking at all ways of using less taxpayer dollars for city-owned entities so the more that your organization could help the city in either raising more dollars to operate the grant will help us down the line that could help another facility or some other city-owned entity that needs assistance too so I it, you know we're gonna be asking that of all the other groups that we work with and partner with too to take a seriously look at your operation side to help us out as a city entity because it's not fundraising taxes we all know that <laughs> what's the capacity of the grand opera house well the actual capacity of the building is 668 seats if you've ever sat in the balcony you'll understand why i usually say the capacity is 500 
Uh, there's a cer- there's a certain breakdown at about 275, which is which goes to uh, Councillor Herman's question, uh, which is when you move into the balcony, and then people start to make serious considerations about uh, what the cost of the ticket's going to be and whether they're going to sit up there uh, for a show, and then that's where we start to that, that that's where a big name breaks a threshold or a popular show breaks a threshold and often uh, the guy with the guitar or the kind of thing that, that comes our way from the community in the top 100 like Alex was talking about earlier uh, sometimes I'll actually have to budget that to 275 to break even and, and, and not plan on the balcony that's a long answer to your question but the, <coughs> the, the simple answer would have been misleading I, go ahead sorry uh, one of the questions that I had is as far as the the people who use the grand does everybody that use the grand pay to use the grand it varies yes pretty much uh there are occasions where we will work into partnerships with community events where uh <coughs> we will waive certain rental costs and they'll cover either a ticket service fee or or the personnel costs to make something happen the the community thanksgiving service may be an op, uh, uh, opportunity to, to where we, where we'll do something like that um the only other place where where that where we trade use of the building for services is is with our three arts partners they will on occasion have rehearsal space uh available in the building uh, for which we'll have no staff. They'll have, they'll have vetted their staff to the point where we can feel comfortable turning the key to them, and they may rehearse uh, half a dozen times in the course of their show uh, with no theater lighting equipment or whatever or personnel needs uh, in, in time that would otherwise be empty in the building that will flip-flop from there. So I just want to give you a complete answer there. But generally speaking, whether it's an education, an outside promoter, a preferred promoter, or uh, a, 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 one of our arts partners, all of them pay rent. All of them also <coughs> pay the dollar per ticket uh, service fee. And so, like, when you guys, because, like, who actually does the grands books, like, the day-to-day, you know, like, the P&L and the balance sheet, who actually does it? I mean, is there grand staff, or, I mean... I have an office manager, yes. Okay, that, that does it. And then it's reviewed by the treasurer. Okay. Do you guys and then, use, of course, audited. Do you guys use QuickBooks? We use a different piece of software. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I, yeah, actually, yeah, I mean, that was I, I, similar to that question. I, I, I also want to ask about community groups because that's that's really uh, uh, kind of a crown jewel of, of what you guys are doing is is the uh, ability of others in the community. And I, I heard from a lot of people who say that uh, they remember performing there as a child or, or have some good memories of it. Um, I, you know, in, in addition to uh, that, that question about the cost, and I appreciate that answer. Is there any priority given to? I, I guess, I guess, if are there, is it kind of first come, first serve as far as when you use a facility? And I ask this because I, I, I've heard from a group that said, you know, we're, we're, we got bumped out of our space. I bet you have. Um, yeah, and uh, well, Joe, Joe will provide some of the details, but there's a board policy okay. that has been approved as far as how it operates with regard to kind of the like you. First come, first serve, whether it's the grand events, the booked events that come in, uh, like our other Guthrie's, where it's a promoter coming in from the outside versus, say, like a, a North, uh, Lourdes, or then going into, of course, our community groups. But you can speak there to the a policy. Priority, there is a priority system of sorts that combines with a first come, first serve uh, system. The priority goes to uh, the grand events, always has. Uh, and we, there's a certain threshold of time where we will take requests, but we will not release dates until we have booked our series uh, of events because a touring artist coming in needs to have that flexibility. That's pretty much an industry standard. Going beyond there, there are the arts partners events receiving priority, then the education partners uh, receiving priority, then the rest of the community receiving priority. We ask each of those groups when they make the requests to make multiple requests so that we can go in that order as we fill them, which happens on or about February 28th of each year. That is a written policy approved by our board. And pretty standard in the industry. And then uh, just commenting real quick on your prior thoughts about the facility and our use in community. That's really one of the things. We go back to the original agreements. It was all about this is a city-owned facility. We want to make sure it's available for the citizens of Oshkosh. And I guess off of that, looking at your printed brochures, I don't see anything that says City of Oshkosh logo or Event City logo or anything that promotes. Event City logo's in there, right there. 
Okay, I missed that one. Thank you. Um, the city of Oshkosh, though, however, is not. No one's ever asked. Well, I think <laughs> if we you ask us, I'm happy to do I that. Think we yeah, we, we, we are usually we, we usually we usually are pretty good. I'm not saying it's in here, but we usually are pretty good at mentioning somewhere in these in, in these things that it's a city-owned building. But if well, we're not, we can do better. Yeah. I think I'm one of the curious more than yeah. anything. I mean, uh, one no, of the common valid, themes that's come up here, and and I've pointed this out to my colleagues up here with me today, yeah. is we've we've not a total candor, we've not done a good job of telling our story. Well, that sounds familiar. And um, you can blame roofs that have gone bad. You can blame you know financial calamity in the nation, but that should not preclude us from getting in front of the people who own this place and love it and telling them how we're doing. And I think what you'd see here tonight is the standard going forward, if not the start of a new standard, you know, where this alone has marketing value to the community that owns that place. This alone is a reminder to them that, hey, it's tough out there and we need your help. Um, I'm not saying it's like a marketing plan. It's not a fundraising plan. Heck no. But it sure is a reminder to them that, you know, and I think we've done a good job of this here in this community. We're partners in this thing. And that's a hallmark of all kinds of initiatives in Oshkosh. We're partners in what we do. We don't just look to one person and say, solve the problem. So I, I do think this, this alone is a good reset on how we need to report back and be accountable to you all. And that's a good point because that was one of the concerns I had heard. I think I talked to Joe a little bit about it, and I know I talked to Al Hartman about it, was from citizens contact me and saying, we never see anything going on to Grand. We drive by, there's nobody there. Right. Cars, nobody in the parking right. lot. Looks like it's empty. And I know we've talked about how sure. it needs to be available for, you know, things going on, and people might come by at different times and don't see it during the day. It could be in the evening, whatever. I know our sure. practices, Ross and Broadway are in the evening. So, But that being said, and I think that's that telling your story. You know, all these dates, you know, um, I was not aware of all that. I, I think the best, the best thing about this process that Alex just said and that I would echo is we don't do this enough. And if it, and in preparing the council to talk to the constituents when that question comes up is not unlike me preparing my board right. to answer those questions when they come up. And can we do better at it? Yes. Is today the first day of that? I hope so. If I could ask a question, I, I was waiting for somebody to ask this question, and and Joe, I was hoping it was going to come up, but it hasn't come up. You know, we talk about the grand being a community asset, and we and we all agree it is. But how we leverage that asset, I think, is very important. And you know, and the question I asked you, Joe, and I'll just restate it: How do you handle this question? Let's say my professional organization is interested in coming to Oshkosh and we have the ability to get a, a performer or we want a performer to come uh, to entertain my group on X date in 2017. So I'm talking two years down the road. By the way, my state association is coming in 2017. <laughs> but we don't have an end. Do you want me to answer it just the way I answered it when just you asked Just if me? we did, and how do you do that for anybody? Not just not just the city, not just for my professional organization. If somebody from the CVB said we can get this convention, but they want they want it they want to use the grand on the Thursday night of their convention, how do you respond to that? I'd look at the calendar. That there's two answers to that depending on the year you mentioned. If you if it was in a year that we were already looking at, I'll give you an example, and uh, Councilor Fitzgerald will be interested because it, it it goes right into the question that you would have said or that you asked earlier. Um, I have been approached and said, "Can you do a, something on a certain date?" Uh, and I look at the calendar, and one of our longstanding partners, like the, yeah, likely the organization that that approached you, has the uh, has the building booked for for an event or for or for a rehearsal. Even I can't pull it away from a long-standing partner for an event. So I, I, the, the back and forth went, can we move it to the lounge and do something there? Well, that didn't quite work. Can we move it to a later time at night to work around the conflict that's there? That didn't work. Sometimes it just doesn't work. We went off, we found a different solution, and, and, and that event will go on, and I hope I get to go see it. When it's far enough in the future and not in a traditional area where we've been serving people for a long time my answer to you is you want me to find the artist for you and and you said no i'd like to find it myself and i said let's work on that we we don't 
have a lot of those opportunities, but that doesn't mean we won't look at those opportunities. It is true that the mechanism for booking the grand tends to be a year in advance. That's the way our businesses are run. You find the same calendar issues virtually any performing arts center up and down the road. Some of them are worse because they have to hold out dates for other things that take up big blocks of their schedule. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't have the conversation and that doesn't mean that when the right thing hits, we do it. I'll tell you how I learned this. The, the way I learned this the most was with weddings. You want to tell a bride that she, she has to wait until six months in advance for a wedding before you'll, com before you'll commit to the hall? That she'll tell you, no, thank you. I'm going to go somewhere else along the way. So we've started to look at, well, if it's between X and X, and we know it's not going to conflict with one of our regular uh, tenants year after year after year, then why don't we look at committing a little bit further out for certain events along the way? Uh, that is a fairly new concept in our office, uh, but it is in place, and there are opportunities, and I hope you're going to look at, uh, at dates for your, so, for so your association. So you can commit to dates down the road provided that there's not a pre-existing conflict it just takes a longer conversation yes but i mean just i mean just oddly enough i mean i, I think my conference is going to be here on march 2nd now do you need you just to pull a calendar or? would you just announce it for example jim belushi's here march 1st i mean in, in 2015 Sean. are you going to block somebody out saying well we might get a name line a, a big name performer so we can't jim belushi second, came on march 1st i announced it last week so that tells you how, you know, that was, a, that was a late addition to the calendar. If you said, let me think for a second. I'm going to give you an I'll example. That, let's say my state association had it booked for March 1st. Jim Belushi wouldn't be coming here then. That's correct. All right. That's correct. But if you came to me, I just want to finish that thought off with a, a non-grand um, uh, example. If you came to me, Mark, and you said, if I were the person that was hosting the Miss Wisconsin pageant, which happens on the same week, on the same year as a regular tenant, does everything. It doesn't happen in the grand, so it's a good example. And you said, I want to book this event, um, 2017, on this week. I'd say, well, you know, that's the week that the Miss Wisconsin pageant is in here traditionally. Can we, can we try to work around that because they're a long time? We have to balance the commitment we have to the community as well. And, 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 and it is a tough balance. It is. And sometimes uh, we have to go other ways. Um, that said... There are 10 of those instances in small amounts of the calendars, and many of the events that you're looking at happen. You know, We have a wide open summer. If someone comes to me and says, I want to work with you on a summer uh, to, to, to coincide with XYZ event in town, uh, I'm all over it. I'm all over that discussion. So it, 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 takes, it takes a conversation when you're talking that far in advance, but it is not, it is not, it is not impossible. Do you look at that monetarily at all? If somebody is trying to book an event that's already booked and they offer you more money for a performance or some sort of incentive. If I had, if I had a contract with Mark and I bumped him for Jim Belushi, I'd never have another contract with Mark again. And uh, well, no, our contract says our, our, the, the, the letter. A dark alley behind yeah. the grand. I, I, I might be beat up. <laughs> But but the the, the, the it, you can terminate. being able to terminate for another in-house event is not uh, not normal. It's not unusual in this industry, but we don't do it. We wouldn't do it. <laughs> I think the real issue there was we need to use the grand as an asset that we can leverage to attract events to the city, be it conventions, um, professional associations, you name it. And and what I'm hearing is. I agree with you, and yet I will also just give the, 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 the caveat that says we are also mandated by this council to serve this community and the, and the residents in the community as well, and I have to balance them. I think we agree that we need a new lease agreement, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> and I think what we're asking for is accountability because it is a city-owned property. We are responsible to the taxpayers. I don't care how the dollars come in, the taxpayer is supporting basically the Grand Opera House. So that's what we're looking for. Will you be looking at, just as a, just as a point of order on this, will you be looking at the, the two contracts, well, the, we only did one in my tenure here, uh, involved the city attorney 
and an attorney hired by the Opera House Foundation hacking out in a room, get doing the things you wanted, doing the things we wanted, and, and working it out. Is that the process that you'll probably want to well, follow I, again? I, I think what will happen, though, first of all, is the council will probably have a closed session on the contract. Talk about the information here. We can have closed sessions on negotiations, <laughs> probably indicate what direction to go, what some expectations, and then the attorneys would probably work it from there. Understood. I think there's going to be some policy stuff that will come out of the council that the council is going to be concerned with. And then within that context, you know, set of expectations or whatever the sure. contract Sure, that's out. reasonable. So yeah, the, the, the that thing that, that we would answer. obviously emphasize is timing. Timing, and I, the one thing I'm going to suggest, and I think it's open to council, is we have a council meeting next week, so I'm going to suggest it. A closed session after the council meeting next Tuesday because we want to get we we want this thing. I think we all want that. We all want it quickly resolved, but there will be a little bit of time involved by the time mm -hmm. that happens. But and that's I, why I we think, asked you guys to come forward mm -hmm. tonight. We appreciate that. Yep, that was a, that was why the push was on, uh, on the majority. So right. I think we're we all want to move forward. We'll have a closed session next week. I suspect out of that we'll we'll figure out just how we go from there in terms of the policy directive to the to the city staff, and then the staff will do the mechanics. We're not going to wordsmith a, what we're going to do, regardless of what it is. We're not going to wordsmith it, but we will have concept, direction, uh, things, expectation. Great. <laughs> While we have the moment. And I, and I think While we have the moment together, I do something that Mark alluded to earlier, that since you are all here as council, I just wanted to make sure I said this. Uh, in my time here, you know, most of you know that the grant started in the Parks Department, and Tom did a pretty good job with it, balancing it with all of the other things he had to do. But um, it was, lo and behold, four or five years ago that, that Mark uh, reconfigured this, and you all moved us into general services uh, uh, with John Urban uh, overseeing uh, and becoming the liaison. Um, I can tell you on behalf of the advisory board uh, and this board, uh, that the the communication and the stewardship that's happened under John uh, has been uh, a wonderful conduit, and you can you can be assured that when it comes to concerns of that building, it's real easy for John to pick up a phone and call me, or for me to walk over and talk to him. And that is a that is a great great um, improvement, Mr. City Manager. Thank you. And. So what does that mean? It wasn't before. Earlier, it was it was more difficult because with Tom, uh, he, he had you know he had a, a thirty five parks or whatever that he was o overseeing as well, and in on our budget, even that 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 little piece that's carved into the budget right now was something he had to administer through the parks department stuff. We just had a, while his heart was in the right place and 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 his effort was in the right place, we didn't have the same ability to connect as as regularly uh, as we do uh, in the current arrangement. We we were, we were a terrible park. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions or comments council members want to know? Um the only other question that I had um on the last lease agreement item number 6 is a written report says the foundation sh shall provide to the city an annual written report that details programs and activities of the Grand Opera House. How did you get away from that? That's fair. And uh, why are sure. why is uh, it taking so long to get back to this point where we're communicating? The written reports were gone by the time I arrived 11 mm -hmm. years ago. I don't know yeah. how we got away from them. But and they I were never gone. received them. I don't think Burke, when you and I, they um, weren't there. But I would normally come in front of the council <clears throat> somewhere in the, in, in the summer uh, and, and, and do you know 10 minutes of of that and and field any questions that came up and that was that was adequate for for where things were then came the summer of 2009 and y'all saw me all the time and by the time we finished it for better or for worse the the annual june didn't happen maybe it's because i saw y'all in april i don't know what that reason is but what i would suggest uh respectfully is that if we, if we want to get back to that and it's not a bad in fact it's a great idea but i'd rather see that it say that we're going to do one of these workshops every yeah. year yeah i, I think great i think we can all sit and do getting, this getting back to what i said earlier and what i think our, where our board's heart is is you know in all respect to the council we're not going to wait for an invitation anymore we're going to contact you and we are going to say as the board that helps you run the place 
time for us to report in, time for us to tell our story. Here's what we did in the last year. Here's how many students came through. You know, here's here's what we're hearing from employers who want to you know donate to the place because they see it building skills. Um, these are the things that are not being said right now, but we all know that are happening there. We just got to tell our story. And and it helps from a community perspective. I'm not sure how many people are considering this must see TV, but it's now out there whether it's webcast or people are watching it live. You are responsible for those taxpayer dollars. This is another way for the citizens of Oshkosh to see what's happening in their building. That's true. Any further comments from council members? Anybody? Thanks. Raise it? Okay, I do want to uh, thank you folks for coming. Uh, Alex, we wish you well because. I assume that you'll be resigning from the board at some point here fairly soon. Or yeah, we haven't seen this. We haven't formally talked okay. about that. Okay. But, yeah. I, but anyway, we wish you well. We hey, thank Miles. you. Thank you. It's the one time we have you here. <laughs> be nice. Terry, thanks for coming in. Gave awesome. us a chance to meet you. You're someone who we don't all know. Frank, it's always good to see you back here in the chambers. Like being home. No, <laughs> thanks for being here. Also, thank there's some other board members here from uh, appreciate them coming I'm sure they heard what was said I appreciate the staff members coming also uh, who, are, who are who are here today um, one thing I would like is you said you did a strategic plan mm -hmm. could you forward that to the city manager sure you've already got the note written strategic got plan it mm -hmm. that that absolutely to it? we went through a formal process with Alan okay too. so uh, that actually dovetails like some that. some of that strategic plan may may help you Councilor Cummings too with, with with your questions I think it would also be helpful to send a of your employees and responsibilities. Sure. Okay, also the council, we will, and Mark, get that voted out there that we will have a closed session to discuss uh, that. And so I'll put on next we'll, Tuesday's agenda. We'll, we'll proceed to that. Council Great. We'll have responsibility for setting up where the locations are out there. Yeah, if there's any information there. that we can reasonably prov provide, <clears throat> just let us know or through Mark. Okay, anything else for the good of the order? Going once, going okay. twice. I thank everybody. Thank I think you. It was a good workshop. So thank you very much. Thank you.